So this is chapter 3, part 2 on Lord's Supper. The uh, second sacrament in the Protestant Church is communion, or Lord's Table, or Eucharist. There are different terms for it. Uh, and this uh, baptism is the initiating sacrament. This is what you do as a new believer, I would say, or as a baby of believing parents. But you begin with baptism, and then you follow up the continuing regularly practiced sacrament, or ordinance if you prefer that term, uh, is communion, or Lord's Supper, or Eucharist. These are different terms. Communion has to do with the fellowship, the sharing that we have. Lord's Supper has to do with the fact that we celebrate what Jesus did in, the, in the, his last supper, the Passover meal before he was crucified. Eucharist is the idea that celebration, and these are all good terms, different contexts for each one of them. And there's a whole series of questions around that, and Dr. Erickson unpacks these helpfully. But let me just summarize these for you. One of these is the, uh, the Roman Catholic view. Uh, well, it's not just Roman Catholic, it's Catholic, but we'll think particularly the Roman Catholic view, and that is the idea that in the communion, in the Eucharist, as, as it would be called, is that you have bread and you have wine, and in the Mass, when the priest uh, comes to that point and he says, uses Jesus' word, this is the body of Christ, that at that point, that that bread, the essence of the bread becomes the actual body of Christ. Uh, the attributes, the outside, are still bread. So you send it to a, you know, a lab to, what is this? They would come back and say, it's bread. But the essence of that is li the literal body of Christ. So when you eat that, you're eating bread, but you're actually eating the body of Christ. And so when, at that point in the service, in a, in a Catholic Mass, he pronounces the word in English, this is the body of Christ. In Latin, it's hocus corpus Christi. Uh, and by the way, that's where the term hocus pocus comes from, is a sarcastic takeoff on the Tridentine Mass. This is the body of Christ. And at that point, the priest holds it up and there's silence in the service because you're worshiping God himself. Same way with the cup. This is the cup. This is the blood of Jesus. You hold it up for worship because that is now the very blood of Jesus. And then when people come forward to receive that, they are actually eating the body of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ, though the attributes are still bread and wine. That's the, the Roman Catholic view. The elements are essentially Christ's body and blood, uh, and that's called sometimes transubstantiation. Lots of details that are important. The Lutheran view uh, is that uh, the bread and wine remain bread and wine, uh, but the presence of Christ is concentrated in that bread, concentrated in that wine. So the idea is, uh, the phrase is that Christ is in, with, and under the, the bread. But the bread's still bread, so it's not like the Roman Catholic view, but this is special stuff. This is concentratedly present here in this piece of bread, in this cup of wine. So when I eat that, in a real sense, I'm eating the body of Christ, and the blood of Christ, but it's not an essential change. Uh, it's just a concentrated presence of Christ in the elements. Uh, and that's sometimes called consubstantiation, though Lutherans don't use that term. They would just call it real presence. That is, Christ is really present in this piece of bread and in this cup of wine. Uh, there's a, a third view sometimes associated with John Calvin, that Christ is uh, spiritually present, and some would say Christ is spiritually present in the elements. More commonly, Christ is spiritually present in the service. And there's nothing particularly special about the elements themselves, but in, the, uh, in this bit of bread and in this bit of wine, that these are powerful places where in this service, as we gather around the Lord's table, that the Holy Spirit, that God is specially present in this service in a way that he's not present in other places of our lives, just say in a prayer meeting or something like that. And typically in a Calvin 
that the two places where God is specially present is word and sacrament. So they would say that the Spirit is specially present in the proclamation of the word as well as in the Eucharist, uh, the communion, the Lord's table that's taken together. And they put word and sacrament very closely together. Uh, and that's sometimes called spiritual presence. There, there's nothing special about the bread and wine, uh, but this is a service. This is a, an, um, a, a practice of the church that's done regularly for God to do his spiritual work in us uh, in that service. And then the fourth view, often associated with Zwingli, or a piece of his life anyway, the memorial view, is there's nothing special about a communion service that be, wouldn't be true of any other service. It's just a time when we get together and we remember what Jesus did and the focus is what Jesus did on the cross. It's not something that Jesus is doing today. It's a memorial of Christ's finished work on the cross. Nothing special about this service compared to other services. And that'd be the memorial view. And that's quite a spectrum. Uh, and, and there are believers who hold all of those. Um, I come out on the spiritual presence side. Uh, I think that when we look at, well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is a place where you get a picture of the, of the work. 1 Corinthians 11, uh, starting uh, at verse 18, uh, he's talking when you come together as a church, uh, he's talking about divisions among you, and then verse 20, he talks about this particular practice. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. Why? Because in the divisions, you're not sharing your food. Uh, each one eats his own meal. So one goes hungry because he has nothing to eat, and one is getting drunk because he's a rich guy and has a lot to eat. And uh, he's, he's just hard on them. You are not doing the Lord's Supper. You are not doing the Lord's Supper. Why? Because there's no communion. There's no sharing going on. And then he remembers back to what Jesus did. I received the Lord what I delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, the night he had betrayed, took bread. When he gave thanks, he broke it. This is my body, which is for you. Do in remembrance of me. And we all quote that. Uh, Say, so took the cup. This is the cup of the new covenant. My blood Do as off you drink in remembrance of me. So that's the, that's the ritual words that we typically use in a service is often you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim Christ's death until he comes. And so there's something, something pretty special that's happening in this sharing together. But then he talks in verse 21, 29, anyone who eats and drinks without deserting the body eats and drinks judgment to himself. Okay, so what do you do to drink judgment? Well, I think in context it's pretty clear if you've got these divisions where the rich guy didn't care about the poor guy and he's feasting and getting drunk while the poor guy is going hungry, you're not deserting the body of Christ. You're not deserting that we're one in Christ where we share with each other. And I think he's saying you eat judgment because the ritual, the sacrament, this practice of Eucharist that you're showing you don't believe in it. You're celebrating an empty sacrament and God takes that very seriously. So I think the, the let each one judge yourselves is to say, are you indeed seeing the needs of other people around you? Are you affirming the unity of this local church that we share together, like Acts 2 and Acts 4 talk about, where we see somebody in need, we help them out. And if you're not doing that, if you've got these factions and divisions, you're violating the very unity that the Lord's Supper is supposed to, to do. And you may be judged by God you may even be dead. <laughs> wow. Some would see that and say, well, no, the judgment is there is if you eat in an unworthy manner, is if you eat with sin in your life, or if you eat where you've not been baptized, or if you eat where you've, you know, you've not had faith in Jesus Christ, that's what it means to be judgment. So somebody who eats and drinks at the Lord's table who hasn't been baptized or doesn't have faith in Jesus Christ, they bring God's judgment on themselves because of their eating in an unworthy manner and the way you become worthy is to become saved and baptized. I don't think that's what it's saying here, but others believe very strongly that it is what it's saying here. 
I think it's talking about the brothers and sisters who don't see the unity and don't care about the needy people. That's the message we see in the prophets, what we see in Jesus, what we see in James. Uh, if you don't care about the needs of the people around you, you show you don't love God. First John chapter 3 is very strong in its statement. How can you say you love God if you don't care about the needs of your fellow Christian? Uh, so I think that's what that is. There's a, there's a lot of issues around that. Uh, how is Christ present? I'm on the spiritual presence side, as I've said. And the way I do that when I, I lead is I, I talk about this is a meal which we celebrate in remembrance of Jesus. And it's a phrase I run where the, the boundaries between heaven and earth grow thin. It's a historic phrase. And in this time is when we have entered that special communion uh, with the Holy Spirit. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? This bread we break, is it not a participation or communion in the body of Christ? There's one bread, who are many are one body, we all partake in one bread. And he talks about that, that communion, that celebration together uh, is what we talk about there. So, how often should we do it? Uh, my tradition is you do it once a month. And apparently it's written somewhere in the Bible that you have to do it on the first Sunday of the month. I haven't found it. I've read the Bible several times, but it's got to be there because it's held with really strong authority in the tradition I come from. Uh, and I say, how come you only do it once a month? Well, we don't want to do it too often because we want it to remain special. We do it every week, then it's not special anymore. Okay. Uh, my sarcastic response is, how often do you preach? Oh, you do it every Sunday. So you, it, the preaching is not special, but sacrament is. And then they get mad at me and start yelling at me. And so once a month is a practice that many do, and they try to make a point out of it. Uh, others do it every time, every week, every time you have a preaching service, you conclude with, with communion. Um, and I actually think that's the pattern we see in Scripture, is they do have a, a sharing of, of the meal every time they get together. But... Again, there's no command at that point, and I think you can do, uh, just be wise in what you do. Should you have communion at weddings? Uh, again, lots and lots and lots of debate about that. Uh, I do weddings. I enjoy doing weddings a lot. And one of the things I ask a couple as they're preparing for their wedding ceremony is various elements they want to have in it. And one possibility is you want to have communion. From my perspective, that's a fine thing to do for a couple to do together as a way of using the Lord's table to be an expressive symbol of their spiritual union as husband and wife. Others say, no, 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 that's ridiculous. Communion is a church thing. If you're going to have communion, then it should be done by everybody that's there. Uh, and I did one wedding, that's what we did. We had communion available for everybody. And others say, well, but there are unbelievers there. Well, there are unbelievers in a church service too similar kinds of things. That's a point of, of difference. Uh, I think communion can be done, should be done, by a whole church as a norm, but I think they're open for... Again, these are points of differentiation. Biblically, who should lead? Who should lead in a communion service, in a, in a Eucharistic service? And, of course, the Bible is absolutely silent, not a hint of who leads the communion service. But in many traditions, the Catholics, only an ordained priest can lead, not even an ordained deacon can lead because they haven't the authority to commit, take this to be the actual blood of Christ. Uh, in my tradition, where I grew up in, uh, uh, that only an ordained pastor could lead. Uh, um, others would say, well, no, it could be any leader in the church doesn't have to be ordained pastor. There's nothing special about ordination, but like any elder could lead. Others would say, well, there's nothing in Scripture. It can be anybody that just, it's a good thing to do at that time. Uh, what do you do? Our church, we typically have one of the elders lead. We usually have the person who's preaching the service, which is an elder, uh, is the one who leads in the communion service. 
so it just kind of smoothly from word down to the sacrament. Uh, if you're, well, how should you do it? <laughs> I grew up in a tradition with little trays with little cups in them and you, uh, and pieces of bread. So the deacons would take that and they'd walk around and pass it down the row and each one would take one and so on. Each one would take the cup and it was the uh, deacons would serve. Well, who gets to serve? Boy, that was a big deal for my wife. When we came into a church where it wasn't deacons who served, it was just ushers, that was really hard for her. Because for her, that was a way of saying that the deacons should be servants of everybody, and to have deacons serving communion was a powerful symbol for her. And to have just ordinary people do it just felt wrong for her. Uh, hard to get done. Uh, we uh, Should you hold the... Uh, the bread and cup up in front and have people come forward and receive it. What should you do after they receive it? I mean, there's all kinds of practices. My view is we do it in various ways, uh, but whatever you do, whatever your practice is, do it as faithfully unto the Lord and do it in a worshipful, orderly kind of way that fits the culture of your church. What's required for participation? This one's a big one. This one's a big one. This is a battle. What do you have to do to qualify to be a participant in communion? Uh, my wife uh, grew up in a context where the only person who could take communion was a member of that local church in good standing. Uh, so when they did their communion once a month, uh, well, when I was dating her, uh, I went to her church, was there for a communion service, and I had actually taught the Sunday school lesson uh, but then when the time for the communion came during the preaching service, uh, the deacon came and he offered the tray to Sherry sitting next to me and then very carefully pulled it way back, walked past me to the next person and handed it to that person. Why? I wasn't a member of the church. I was about to marry the daughter who had been leading the singing, but I wasn't a member of the church, so I couldn't take it. I wasn't totally happy about that to be sure, but that's their practice. Okay. Others would say, well, it should be a member of a church because baptism and church membership t go together. And it should be a member of a church of like faith and practice, so a gospel-believing church. So if you're a member of a gospel-believing church and you're visiting, you're welcome to take the communion. Others would say, well, no, if you're, a, you're just members of, uh, of a church uh, and have been baptized, that that would qualify you to do that. Others say, well, if you're just, you know, like if you're just saved, you don't have to be baptized necessarily. You don't have to be a member of the church. But if, you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that qualifies you to be a uh, participant in the Lord's Supper. Others would say, it's an open invitation. If you want to participate in the life of Jesus in some way, if you're a seeker and just want to participate in his life somehow, it's not going to have the same meaning for you it would for a believer in Jesus Christ, but it's meaningful, come and partake. All kinds of views there, and very, very strong views on this. Uh, where do you come out on that? Again, there's no specific command in Scripture. It's just kind of a practice and an and, uh, implication of how you see that practice. So again, this is a spot where I think a church should think it carefully, have a practice, and then be consistent and explain well what's going on. Uh, the phrase I come out with is when I lead communion is I usually say something like, if you'd like to have come and have a meal with Jesus, then come and be a part of that. Now, I recognize Jesus is not a part of there, and he's not going to physically eat with us till the kingdom. But I think that anybody who wants to do business with Jesus, that the communion is a good thing to do for them. Uh, again, these are places where there's a lot of variation. Uh, well, there are, you know, where do you do it? Does it have to be in a church building? Can it be in a youth retreat? Can it be, um, you know? What do you use? What are the elements? Well, at the Passover, it's unleavened bread and wine. So if we follow the example of the Passover, that's what we should use, matzah and wine. Many churches now will have, <laughs> they'll have, um, some little cracker type thing, maybe matzah, and they'll have gluten-free beside it. 
and they'll have wine and they'll have grape juice. So when you come down to the table out in front, you've got options to pick from. <laughs> How very American. Oh my gosh, there's all kinds of stuff there. My take on that, again, I don't think we have to be narrowed down. We have our practices at my church, and we follow them carefully and wisely, I think. But this is not a spot where Scripture gives us any particular absolute commands. So I'm going to be on the spiritual presence. I'm going to have the communion service led by the same kind of person who's preaching the word for that service. I'm going to have it in an open invitation to anybody who wants to do business with Jesus to come and partake in this. I'm going to ask people to consider themselves if they're in sinners and in need of God's grace to be aware of that sin and come to the table to receive God's grace to deal with that sin. That's the way I unpack it in my particular church. Let's not fight about it. But I realize we're going to have to divide over some of these things among denominations because they just mean really different things. But let's divide as friends, not as enemies, and affirm the unity of God's church and the body of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm.